lecture for Asia Week. Um, Dr. It. Johnson has spoken several times in the gallery, has done great lectures over the past. She has a PhD from New York University. She's currently working on uh, several books. One of them is The Birth of the Chinese Ancestor Cult, the Shang and Ritual Bronzes. She's also uh, working on the Oxford Handbook of Ancient China. And she is the editor and uh, contributor to the auction, as well as 32 other scholars. Um, Dr. Johnson has been uh, a specialist in Buddhist art and early Chinese ritual bronzes, as well as uh, ancient Chinese jades. She co-authored a fantastic book called The Jade Age, which compared Neolithic jades in American museums. And uh, it's a seminal book. We have it for sale. It was published in Beijing, and it's a co-publication with Science Press from Beijing. So um, without further ado, Dr. Johnson. Thank you very much. And thank you for coming out at the end of it, usually, rather than the beginning. Um, I appreciate that very much. I want to begin. I want to, is that good? I want to begin by showing just two videos, uh, very five-minute videos of the Cave Temple of Yongang. Because what I would like to talk about today is basically what's represented in this exhibit is the uh, cinification of Buddhism as it came from India and as and was uh, reinterpreted. Uh, can you all hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. That came from India, was uh, slowly cinified, and that went through another phase of influence due to Gupta period India, and uh, sort of was a crowning achievement of this a second revolution in, uh, in terms of Buddhist iconography and imagery happened during the late 6th century, and then of course the Tang, Imperial Tang period, when Buddhism became uh, completely Chinese on its own and had standards of its own, which were not necessarily reliable, uh, relying on standards uh, from, from uh, India. So what I'd like to do is uh, show, just for you to get into the, uh, you know, the spirit of the cave temple products of Buddhist imagery, as they first entered China, we're going to see two short clips on Yungang. Let them roll. <laughs> Thank you. 
strongly outlawed Buddhism and killed many Buddhist monks. The numerous Buddhas carved into the robe of this statue were supposedly created in memory of those killed. Status. 
30 to 50 meters tall. They are U-shaped and have archer roofs imitating the Thatcher sheds in ancient India. The images have tall bodies and occupy the major part of the caves. While on the outer walls, the 130 distinctives are carved. This picture is rarely seen in the traditional of history of grotto carving in China. The caves numbered 16 to 20 are the oldest complex and each one symbolized one of the first of five emperors from the Northern Wei dynasty. The famous emperor is the Buddha. The Buddhist leaders of the time believed that worshipping Buddha was essential for worshipping the emperor. The Vika Rattles constitute the masterpiece from the first of Chinese Buddhist art. They represent the successful fusion of Buddhist and religious symbolic art from Southern and Central Asian with Chinese cultural traditions. and fighting between lineages and families and the fall of the Han Empire uh, in the 3rd century AD, there was nothing but chaos and, and hope for some sort of resolution or salvation. And of course, Buddhism entered China at this particular time and became popular amidst the uh, dynastic powers, and not only in the south where the traditional uh, uh, southern native culture had, had, had revived itself and moved from the north, but in the north, uh, since they were foreigners who were dominating uh, China, they wanted to utilize something that would unite China under their, um, under their uh, rulership. And so Buddhism was the answer. Buddhism basically became a, a political organ of the uh, government in both North and South China, but South and North China were divided. And I'm showing you this just because these are all in the gallery, and this is I'm showing what happens in the beginning um, on the two left um, uh, middle images, um, one in, which is right here, and another. Uh, uh, back here. Where the Bodhisattva is there, and the Buddha is back there. These two represent sort of a Gandhara and Greco Roman influence when Buddhism was just init initially entering China and being interpreted based upon Indian prototypes that came from the northwest part of India known as Gandhara um, uh, after, after um, <clears throat> uh, Alexander and his troops had left that particular era, area and there were really two tr stylistic traditions developed, one associated with the native Indian center of Mathura, another with Gandhara and the Greco-Roman tradition that had 
been left over as sort of a satrapy, but which uh, was responsible for developing the first images of, of Buddha in India. So this represents an imprint. So that's what we're looking at today, sort of the beginnings based on foreign models from India and the Chinese aesthetic, which, which really uh, uh, was a crowning achievement of the second phase of division between North and South dynastic China, which covers the 6th century AD. Next, please. And so this is, I mean, it's really impossible, and I don't expect you to know all the, the names of all these different dynasties, but this is just exactly how confusing Chinese history is at this particular time. From 220 AD to 589 AD, the so-called Sixth Dynasties period, and the Sixth Dynasties, by the way, have to do with the Southern Dynasties based in the capital at Nanjing, which is close to Shanghai. It's a period of disunity and instability following the fall of the Han, and this is when Buddhism was introduced. Through the Three Kingdoms, the Cao, Wei, Shu, Han, Dong, Wu, the Three Kingdoms, then the Jin Dynasty of East and West, and then the Northern and Southern Dynasties from the 4th through the 6th century, and this is when, uh, really, by the 4th, 5th, and 6th century is when Buddhism is, is, is the state religion. It dominates all of China. Whether it's uh, under the jurisdiction of the Northern Way in the North, or under the uh, jurisdiction of the Southern uh, Dynasties, Liao, Song, Southern, Qingyang, based, uh, their capital, which is based at Nanjing. And then, of course, there's another period of di division after the Northern Way, into Western and Eastern Way, and Northern Zhou and Northern Qi, uh, and these are all, if they're not in the South, but they're in the North, they're uh, <clears throat> a 90% 90, 90 uh, run by Toba Wei, or these Turkish invaders from the North. Okay, so next please. So what I really want to point out, and this is uh, uh, in the, basically in the article, is that the development of Buddhist art in China was dependent on, one, a transmission from India, and two, upon adaptation and invention by Chinese artists and patrons. And so when it enters China along the Silk Road, uh, sometime during the first and second centuries AD, um, it wasn't really, though, until it, it became very popular, because as you see, China was just divided, uh, the Han Empire had ended, and there was disunion everywhere, <clears throat> and they, their, it, yeah, Buddhism just became much more popular. People were sent back to India to translate sutras. There were lots of monks coming to the North China, uh, but as we find out, uh, also South China. Uh, so we, uh, so through the third through fifth, uh, Sinified style developed by the late fifth and early sixth centuries reinterpreted a second revolution of Buddhist styles with the influence again from India, Gupta in India, not Gandhara in India, during the mid-6th century. So we'll look at those two, two uh, revolutionary periods with the middle one sort of signified by uh, sinification, and actually at the end, uh, full sinification. And you know what sinification means. Sino means uh, Chinese. <coughs> So from the second to fifth, this is when Buddhist imagery was adapted and gradually reinterpreted uh, Gandhara and prototypes. In the second phase, Buddhist styles underwent signification. The third, influenced by Gupta and very uh, uh, prototypes from India, which uh, were also uh, felt from Southeast Asia, Indonesia, Vietnam, Cambodia, ancient Funan. We'll talk about that. Um, next, please. So there, uh, I won't go through all of this, but just to point out simply that there are re really two major periods of influence from India, and one middle period of sinification, uh, and that, that sort of whole identification was really founded by this guy named Alexander Soper, who I got my PhD with at the Institute of Fine Arts. And he's the guy who really introduced Chinese art history into this country. He was the first graduate to get a degree in Chinese art history or Asian art history. And he went through all the text, and but and so this is really a coup, which he, which happened in, uh, in the 1950s, 1960s, about the understanding of Buddhism and how it evolved, and why it ended up uh, basing its uh, ultimate evolution on Chinese native Chinese aesthetics. Uh, next, please. So this is what you see. China is divided uh, by the. Uh, 
by the uh, fifth, fourth, fifth, and sixth centuries into the northern way in the north. Uh, and this is, as I said, uh, under Turkish Toba, uh, Toba so-called Toba way uh, domination, where their capital, I'm sorry this isn't that clear, um, and, and a sort of native Chinese tradition right around here, in, and this is not so far from Shanghai, Nanjing, it's, it's an ancient, uh, the ancient term is Jiang, Jian Kang, and the Northern Wei Dynasty is way up in Shanxi, uh, which, which is actually unclear on this map, but there is a, a Northern Wei capital, and then there's a Southern uh, uh, Song capital, Song, what, this is called the Six Dynasties period. This is when the Northern Wei rules, and the Southern, uh, and the Southern Dynasties, uh, the second one is Song, the first one is Liang, and another is Chen. And then the northern, northern way keeps the northern way until they split into western way and eastern way. Okay, but this is, and these notes just describe that the entry of Buddhism into China is really cool because it comes in these small sort of forms. May I have the next slide? This is in, in southeast China. Um, uh, you find these, this cliff carved with images that look very stick like and uncomfortable. Uh, but they're Buddha images, and they're carved into the rock cliff in sort of imi in imitation of Chaicha halls in India, which were carved in rock um, in various places uh, in, in uh, Gandharan, during the Gandharan Madhura periods as well as the Gupta period. So you find these sort of uh, funny, funny interpretations of exotic foreign images of Buddha in relief on these rock cliffs. One has been identified at this place in Jiangsu, which is uh, where the uh, southern capital is located, near Jiankang or Nanjing, where they have beautiful gardens. Next, please. So initially, uh, Buddha was absorbed as one of these typical immortals of Han belief, of Chinese belief. And so in this Han funerary jar, uh, which depicts uh, a sort of pagoda-like uh, uh, architecture where mortals dwell, and uh, but on the outside of this funerary jar, which accompanied the deceased after death, uh, are all these sort of immortal figures of Buddha, uh, little tiny uh, applique images of the Buddha. So the Buddha image at this particular point in the second, third, fourth century AD was basically an immortal, just like all the other Taoist images that were decorating funerary utensils that were buried with the deceased in the afterlife. I mean, they're cute. They look like meditating, little meditating images. Yeah, but they're not any different from the other immortals that Chinese believed in, uh, which would guarantee immortality in the afterlife. Next, please. And this is sort of a fuzzy picture, but again, just a, another example of this is uh, a cosmological tree, a Han period cosmological tree in bronze. And on the branches are all the immortal deities are represented like the goddess of the West, but so too is the technical images of the Buddha, as you see in this fuzzy, you know, very uh, difficult to read <laughs> image. For example, this is a Buddha image and he's on a, uh, he's right here. Um, and I'm sorry, it isn't clear, but the white background inhibits clarity as well as my photography. So, next please. So when Buddhism enters, it's usually uh, it, not only the Yogan Colossi, which we'll discuss in a minute, but with these small scale images that were probably imitated in China in uh, gilt bronze. And this is one of the earliest images of Buddha that's known in China and dates to one of the southern, uh, one of, well, many kingdoms, but in the south to the fourth century. And it has an inscription on the back. And it's an Asian art museum. And it's small, it's not very big. <clears throat> but the, this, at this particular time, Buddhism takes over. It's well patronized, there, there are lots of believers, there are lots of traffic uh, along the silk, northern and southern routes of the Silk Road. And Mahayana is adopted, the Mahayana faith of Buddhism, not Hinayana, which is the monastic form, but the belief in other saviors, that everybody can be saved um, uh, if they just believe in one of the Buddhas, whether it's Shakyamuni Buddha or Amitabha, Amida, <coughs> or, or others, uh, <coughs> or Bodhisattvas. So 
So in, in the meanwhile, uh, image, uh, images were being created, Buddhist faith was expanding, and this on the right is the Gantaran prototype. Right? You can probably sort of pick out what looks like an interpretation of Western, of Western uh, robes. This is a typical stone image of the meditating Buddha from the northwest part of India in meditating prose. And you can see uh, naturalistic uh, emphasis is more prominent on the Gandharan uh, image from India than the small little uh, meditating Buddha in gilt bronze from early China in the fourth century. I mean, you can see prominent differences between the two, but the attempt by the uh, Chinese artists to imitate or, or uh, uh, create something that was exotic and new and, and a release from all the trouble uh, that they, <clears throat> their personal lives had been uh, involved in. Everything is sort of symmetri uh, symmetricized, if there is such a word. If, uh, it's, the Buddha's robe is, has a symmetrical uh, uh, draperies, the cowl is symmetrical, the hair is symmetrical, and there's not really a, an understanding of naturalism in terms of the way the Buddha's hair is interpreted in the Gantaran piece, and the robe is you know, naturally falls in, in folds that are understandable. Whereas it's all sort of mechan mechanical in the Chinese adaption of a foreign prototype. Next, please. So uh, this, the idea is to find some, uh, to get some sort of resolution out of political chaos and desolation. So karma, the cause and effect, became very popular. And uh, so by the fourth century, uh, the China was just a petri dish for, the, for soaking up all these new influences coming from India. And the nomadic peoples of the north, as well as the Chinese in the south, who were pushed south by the invaders from the north to this capital, Nanjing, and other traditional southern areas, um, both supported Buddhism as, as the answer to their uh, plight in life um, at that particular time. So this is what the uh, Toba way uh, of the Northern Way period decided to do is to open these cables, uh, cave temples, these uh, grottos at Yonggang, which means uh, Mount, uh, Cloud Terrace in Datong, Shanxi, which is in the Northwest, where the capital in the North, or the uh, Way established their capital. There, lots of things were being opened up, and Donghuang is one of the most uh, famous cave temples in China. Uh, Yonggang is, is the other, and Longmen, Maijishan, and Gansu. I mean, there's everything begins to be open. Uh, there. China, Buddhism just takes over. It's, it's the state religion as well as, as the, uh, the uh, common belief of the people. Uh, Bing Lin Si, Maijishan. Um, next, please. Okay, so these five colossal Buddhas are built at Yungang by uh, the uh, Toba Wei dynasts. And this is, I mean, they're really not so attractive. They're just these huge, big, monstrous images carved out of sandstone in the sandstone cliff outside of Datong, the Northern Wei capital. There were five caves, caves open, as we saw in that short little uh, video, right? And uh, this, is one of the, this is one of the first ones. It's cave 16 through cave 20. And the facade has fallen off, but you see the holes. It would have been an architectural facade that looks like a Buddhist cave temple. Mm -hmm. But seated Buddha in this meditating uh, uh, position with other Buddhas on his left and right. Uh, these Buddhas were Tathagatas, or, or Buddhist saviors. And they represent the Mahayana Buddhism of Shakyamuni, and these are supposed to be the Buddha of the present, past, and future. But look how archaic they look. They look very archaic, and that's because the Chinese are creating these colossi on the, on the same sort of scale that uh, uh, the images at Amaravati or other uh, cave temples in, in uh, India were. I mean, it was modeled on the Indian um, uh, precedent. But the interpretation uh, creates a very sort of archaic uh, expression. And this is oftentimes labeled as this sort of archaic period, the initial period of Buddhist art in China. And you can see why the drapery in this particular case is very schematic and symmetrical but, and, and interpreted in Chinese by Chinese hands. The face has this archaic smile that looks like it was borrowed between or it came from somewhere. And the, the Chinese eyes aren't exactly Chinese, but they're 
and the, the proportions are, are certainly colossal, but the interpretation is, is what we can call sort of rough and archaic because it is based on a prototype that they didn't completely understand. And the robe, as you know, it doesn't expose the full body. It just it covers most of the body and one shoulder. In this case, it covers both shoulders. May I have the next, please? So, and the other Buddhas, these from, uh, there were five uh, caves open to honor the five uh, over a 60 year period to honor the uh, different <coughs> rulers of the Northern Way period, except for this one, one guy who, who decided, like so many uh, emperors in Chinese history, that he didn't want to follow the way of the Buddhists, he wanted to follow the way of the Taoists. So he persecuted Buddhists, I mean, throughout the land. And so, as it said in the film, in the video, if you could hear, all these little images of meditating Buddhas decorating the Buddha's robe are supposed to symbolize uh, the spirits that were uh, uh, killed by the uh, uh, third Northern Way emperor who tried to get rid of Buddhism. He wanted control for himself, so reverted to another religious tenet, which didn't work. Uh, these are two sort of archaic other colossi at Yongang uh, that show this foreign foreign style being interpreted on a major, major, you know, ten times uh, life-size images, which uh, were painted, were, were bodily painted, um, uh, but none of that is uh, preserved today. May I have the next? And this is just the one, it shows this particular image of, of the uh, uh, historic Buddha is standing, holding his robe in his left hand and exposing his uh, chest um, on the upper right shoulder area, where those tiny little Buddhas imitated or, or represented on his robe. Um, and we do know the people who are responsible of persuading or, you know, conning whomever into following the Buddhist way. The Shim Bay or Toba Way invaders had a monk who wanted and who supported them, and other monks who, who said, look it, if you're going if, if to stay here and continue to control uh, northern China or be influenced by southern uh, China, then you've got to adopt Buddhism and you've got to make the emperor uh, uh, Buddha incarnate. So these colossal Buddha, uh, Buddhas of the, uh, at Yongang were believed to represent imperial power or the emperors themselves. And they were, and they were uh, uh, created successfully. Uh, uh, one by one, not over uh, in, in five generations at least of emperors. So uh, Fabwa, the head monk, said, advocated that emperors, quote, emperors are contemporary Buddhas and monks should pay respect and obey them. So too should the people. And, and so uh, it, it worked. Uh, so when Fabwa reported to the emperor, he took the step of hailing the emperor as a living Buddha. I mean, it's sort of like Mao Zedong today. You know that Mao Zedong's portrait is on the Forbidden City, and guess who, guess whose portrait is probably going to take over that? Xi Jinping. Okay, so that's the five caves that Yungan became icons of the foreign rulers, yet leaders who led the led the people out of chaos. Begun in 460, uh, Buddhism became the state religion, and they adapted this style, and over time. Uh, who are familiar with it enough to incorporate their own, own preferences. And may I have the next one, please? So I wanted to show you again, this is the, these are the Gantara prototypes that uh, are, can be loosely used as uh, the prototypes for the imagery represented at Yongang and at Donghuang and at Maiji Shan and other places that were opened uh, during the 4th and 5th centuries AD. The Mataran, very Indian type of uh, Buddha in a seated position, red sandstone, same material that Asia society is built out of, by the way, imported from India. And uh, the Gandharan version, the Greco-Roman version, much more naturalistic and this much more based upon <coughs> uh, the bodily control of, of air and the standing image of the Gandharan Buddha. Next, please. So another uh, of the cave, uh, other caves at Yongang were opened before they were completely closed by the end of the uh, uh, end of the fifth century, 
And these show this sort of plan uh, that's been well known since Soper's day, and he's, he's the one who outlined these, is that you have a, either a central pillar with four niches and Buddhas, or you have a central Buddha. But in both cases, or a Buddha back here, in both cases, you can circumambulate, which, mean, which is the um, is the way that these cave temples function in India. You know, you circumambulate around the stupa in order to gain uh, karma or good karma um, and follow the Dharma or Buddha law. So uh, they're there, but but you can see the images are all over the place, and they're they're. Uh, Every single uh, inch of the uh, cave temple is, is carved with some sort of dedication. What you begin to see are cartouches identifying which lay devotee or which Buddhist, uh, uh, Buddhist abbot um, <coughs> committed to supporting the construction of a particular relief within the cave uh, temples themselves. But these were opened, uh, there were a couple of their other caves uh, in pairs or in threes at Yulman that were also opened, and some are preserved with paint intact. And they show images which have to do with the life of Buddha. But what you can see in these small little details is that uh, Chinese, uh, uh, fundamental Chinese uh, properties uh, appear, such as this when, when, in this particular relief, is the departure of uh, Siddhartha. Gautama, when he leaves his, his family of riches to begin a, a life of, of monastic, a monastic um, um, <clears throat> training, he lives on a horse. I mean, they're not in scale, but the, but the point is, is is that this household is a Chinese household represented by a tiled roof and a but uh, supporting balustrades that are supporting uh, branches that uh, uphold the roof. Uh, so there are Chinese elements that, that uh, uh, outstrip those coming from India, and of course all the all the uh, <coughs> curlicue images um, and the tiled roof lines below are typically uh, Chinese. So slowly uh, these infiltrate the interpretation of Buddhist imagery. Next, please. So that by uh, by about 495 or 500 A.D., Buddhism becomes Sinified. We look at it, uh, details from another cave temple called Donghong, which probably most of, lots of you have heard of. It's at the end of the Silk Road uh, in the northwest part of China in Gansu province. And uh, Donghong was open just as early as Yongang. But these particular slides show two things. The signification of Buddhism in terms of the Buddhist robe, the Buddhist eyelids, the, uh, uh, the dress that the Bodhisattvas or other, uh, other figures wear. Um, as well as these donors who are represented. These are two separate beliefs. These don't go together. These are two separate inside the cave temple at Dong Hong. Um, this is the famous debate represented in two different uh, ways. One with the Buddha in the center above, where the Bodhisattva of Wisdom and this lay holder, uh, Prabhupada I mean, <coughs> excuse me, I mean, when Ju. When um, Sorry, uh, not, not one, two, that's the Bodhisattva of Wisdom uh, by Vimalakirti. Okay, so it's this debate uh, with the Buddha image, and this debate comes from the Lotus Sutra, and it's something entirely Chinese in invention. It was never represented in India. So, what you get with the signification of Buddhism is the ad adoption of Buddhist aesthetic, uh, Chinese aesthetics as well as Chinese themes that are based on sutras, on actual Buddhist texts, in which it, there is a debate, but and they take it one step further and it becomes a, a Bhimankiri Nardesa uh, sutra. And it's not clear exactly where, whether it was totally invented in China uh, or not, but probably. And the debate is similarly represent the uh, appearance of two Buddhas another type of image from the Lotus Sutra, the major Mahayana uh, Buddhist text, like the Bible, is represented below. But the point is, is what you're witnessing here is all these little donors are dressed in Chinese uh, robes. And this lay holder, who's a, a Buddhist devotee, actually outwits the Bodhisattva of wisdom in terms of talking about uh, the extinction and nirvana and what it means, and I'm not going to go into philosophical detail here, 
but you just have to take my word that it was a tie. Uh, but this, this Buddha is wearing a dress uh, and a robe that is entirely Chinese in invention and has nothing to do with the Sangati or robe uh, as it was interpreted in the mantra in the Tarn um, context. May I have the next one, please? And this is just a close-up of that particular detail. What you see is there's a tie uh, here to an inner shirt, and, then, and this looks like a changpao, or a Buddhist robe that's, that, that, that is draped over one arm and covers this arm. And that, in fact, it covers most of the Buddha in honor of this Confucian tradition of modesty. And then, and then the skirt of the outer robe it forms this sort of um, incredibly rhythmic design <coughs> that uh, is a schematic interpretation of the drapery. But, and what you also witness is the fiery um, uh, spits of, of um, motion coming from the, from the aureole. And this again, this sort of interest in creating rhythm and uh, height is totally uh, Chinese in interest and aesthetic. So, if you look closely, you'll find that also the face is very Chinese in interpretation. The eyelids are this uh, you know, uh, typical of the uh, eyelid of most Mongoloid peoples. So at this point, you find sort of sinification of Buddhist styles and a continued euphoria in the practice of Buddhism uh, in China. Next, please. And this is a, a, a stele that was identified long ago by, by Sober who put Buddhism on the map of uh, Asia and the U.S., Buddhist art. It's a stele that's uh, uh, left uh, and not finished, but what it witnesses is a, um, a particular stele dated to 483, which was before the Northern Way moved south to Luoyang to open Lomang Caves and adopt formally everything uh, uh, from China in terms of costume, in terms of language, in terms of names, and, and, and intermarry uh, with, with the um, Han Chinese. And this particular image identifies basically in 483 the use of the Chinese robe, uh, this, which creates a sort of waterfall effect over the pedestal and with the throne on which he sits in this Apaya Mudra. But you can see the long sash of the uh, coming from the inner shirt. That's Chinese. That's invention. That's an invention of the Chinese to interpret their um, their role that uh, I'm going to show you where. Um, and this particular uh, image is very interesting because it comes from Sichuan. And Sichuan, if you know the map of China, is in the southwest part of China, uh, and. <clears throat> they took sort of their inspiration from missionaries, uh, Buddhist missionaries who were arriving at uh, uh, Nanjing, as well as those who were arriving overland uh, from the south uh, via uh, India into uh, China. This is what it's called, the epicanthic fold, which some of you in the audience have yourself. And this is what, what uh, characterizes most of the facial um, uh, or the eyes of the uh, Buddhas in this particular phase of sinification. Next, please. Okay, so here, historically what happens is represented by these two short paragraphs is there was a decision to move away from the north, the very north, far up north, where the Yongdang cave temples were located, and further northwest where Yongdang and where Dongpang was located, to move south. Uh, this guy, uh, 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 Xiaowen, implemented a drastic policy of sinicization or sinification, intending to centralize the government, make his multi-ethnic state easier to govern and assimilate. He not, uh, you know, his predecessors had opened up Yongdang, that, that was eventually abandoned. Um, he included changing artistic styles to reflect Chinese preferences and forcing the population to speak the language to wear Chinese clothes. This so often happens in Chinese history. Uh, when the Mongols come in or when the um, uh, uh, Manchus come in, this oftentimes happens. It's this adaptation of Chinese aesthetics and uh, practices and language and, and intermarriage. So even even Shawan took his, the surname, uh, not his Toba surname, Turkish one, to uh, Chinese Wenyuan, 
But the crowning achievement occurred in 494 when this emperor moved the northern Wei capital from the northwest to Pingchong or Datong uh, to Luoyang, a city long acknowledged as a major center of traditional Chinese um, uh, practice and, um, and beliefs and history. Next, please. So, what happened? Another cave temple was opened, and this was by uh, as, uh, the um, uh, uh, Emperor Xuanwu uh, Shaowen died before, or, or I guess he just got there, and he opened this cave temple on the Yi and Lo rivers in Henan. Uh, Luoyang had been the eastern Han capital, and it's sort of a center of traditional China. So basically, he moved further south and uh, abdicating the Tobo Wei practice for something that was completely Chinese, but they still maintained power. And these guys opened this uh, cave temple, Longman, which is very famous. Why is it so famous? Because two of its reliefs are now in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and the other is in Kansas City at the Nelson Atkins Gallery. And they have to do with the imperial procession reliefs which come from these walls. It's, it's called the Emperor and the Empress Procession. And it uh, represents basically Shaowen and the Dowager Empress Hu, Emperor Xuanwu, in 500 through 515 when he built these cave temples um, uh, out of limestone in, uh, near Luoyang, Henan, um, opened up in honor of his, his parents. Uh, and here, you can, if you look closely, any of the, the many, most publications on Buddhist art in China include this particular cave temple called the Lotus Cave Temple because of the lotus and the, and the, and the, uh, serving as the canopy over this Buddha. But he's in this mudra, and what does he wear? He wears the tr traditional Changpao, or Chinese robe, with an undershirt tied with a sash. Totally modest, not exposing his chest as with the Indian mantra and image do, uh, but in representing basically the sin of vacation of Buddhism. So I, instead of calling this, I think it's I'm, uh, elongated style. This is, but the term I think is inappropriate for this period. Sinified style is is what characterizes this new phase of Buddhism when it moves its capital, the northern way, moves their capital south. And you can see it in uh, the sort of rippling effect of the overhang and the drapery. This emphasis upon calligraphic rhythms is very much Chinese and aesthetic and has nothing to do with uh, India. Next, please. Okay, this is just some more historical data if you want evidence for uh, the popularity of these new of, of uh, uh, a new influence that comes to uh, that uh, comes to dominate uh, painting as well as um, um, what doesn't exist, but did does exist in, in histories and textbooks that there is a lot going on in terms of uh, uh, Buddhism in the way it's expressed stylistically. Uh, there are lots of painters whose paintings are, are known. Uh, you know, Buddhism was persecuted so many different uh, times in its history that very little of other than these big cave temples uh, still survive, and of course all of these sculptures that are represented here. Um, but this you should notice, just to, uh, is that according to the, the Wei, Wei Shu, the history of Wei in the five tens, there were about 13,727 Buddhist monasteries for monks and nuns in local states and cities. I mean, that's huge. And uh, in the 520s, the early 6th century, the Northern Way had nearly 2 million monks and nuns living in more than 30,000 monasteries. Repre a representative is the opening of completely new grottos at, at a place we'll look at in a minute, Ch briefly, Chinyang and Gansu, uh, dated to 509, and other things like uh, Lungman. Next, please. So here you see the new Sinified style, represented by this adoption of, of Chinese habits uh, in these robes that the standing Buddhists wear. I mean, you can see all this sort of uh, Chinese, you know, flat, sort of flattening the image and emphasizing the rhythm of drapery, uh, loosening it up. It's no longer this sort of archaic uh, 
mechanical interpretation of the so-called archaicizing style in the first period, but rather a cinified style with a cinified robe and a cinified uh, facial features. And this is a new cave temple that was opened about the same time that Lungman was, in about 500. Next, please. And this really represents the whole sort of uh, height and calligraphic rhythm that was uh, so emphasized elsewhere in imageries, in reliefs, uh, relief images from temples, even in the Lungman Cave Temple. You can't see the detail as well, but this is at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, this particular work. And, it, and it's a gilt bronze altarpiece. It probably would have it had its own uh, temple enclosure, but it's just a beautiful example. Although it emphasizes symmetry, I mean, you can see the, in the rhythm of the apsaras as they decorate the exterior of the mandala behind the Buddha. Um, I'm talking about these winged, <laughs> winged forms that you can't really see clearly but there are these winged forms that are neither female nor male, uh, but they accompany the Buddha. And uh, what is also, so you get this incredibly excitable uh, expression by the open work of the mandala, uh, you know, uh, forming the background for this Buddha, Shakyamuni Buddha image. And then there's a sort of rhythmical uh, decoration expressed through the different uh, hemlines of the road, the inner road, the outer road, and another one. And then, of course, these lions are in different different positions um, of expression, sort of echoing a yin yang type of formal balance. Um, there's a lot, uh, a lot more detail that, that adds to this incredibly hyper uh, expression of this uh, steely that characterizes this cinified style. Next, please. And you can you can witness it, particularly in these eastern. Eastern Way images uh, that are represented here, but this is what what is so interesting is that you know it's a lot more complicated than uh, the Buddhist revolutions that hit China. And Buddhism has not died in China; it's still going strong, but it's discouraged. Um, the second revolution, and again a new Indianizing phase after this cinified phase, comes from India, but it primarily again comes from, from traditional southern China. Uh, in Sichuan as well as Nanjing. Um, and it comes uh, via sites like Amaravati, uh, later kingdom, uh, Gupta period in Mahamalapuram in Pallava kingdom, India, and Amarapura in, in Sri Lanka, where maybe some of you have been. Uh, these are, this is the Guptan style that takes over and now influences China once again before it goes its own way in the Tang period. Uh, Western and Eastern Way, uh, China becomes divided again between Western and Eastern Way. That's again these these uh, these uh, Xianbei peoples who establish a capital in Chang'an and then in in the east, and then the southern dynasties continue to um, somehow function in the south. But they're they're still you know absolutely totally dedicated uh, you know on the political top end as well as the political low end in supporting Buddhism. So despite this political turbulence and civil war that broke out, uh, the Luoyang area and Nanjing continue to promote uh, Buddhist production. And um, after these Western and Eastern Way broke up. Then what took over in their place are, are dynasties called the Northern Zhou and the Northern Qi. Yeah. So the Northern Qi are represented by a Chinese lineage, and the Western one, the Northern Zhou, are represented by a, a Shen Bei rulers, these total way people relations. So the Buddhist style, though, that emerged from this is oftentimes called columnar. Uh, next, please. And this is just to give you an idea where, where Chang'an is in the northern Zhou, uh, northern Qi, and in the southern Chun, this is Nanjing. So Buddhism thrives. Next. Uh, but this is what happens. All of the images look like big columns, as if their bodies are something somehow suddenly really important. Uh, and sometimes they look like they're elongated. Sometimes they look just like columns. And this is a, uh, 
you don't have to take my word. It's it, but this is Northern Joe, which is always more conservative than uh, Eastern Way or Northern Chi, is represented on the left. Steely uh, showed this new emphasis that you see it more evident in other sculptures where the body is much more important. Um, solidity, wet drapery. Uh, this is a sort of effect that you find due to a renewed influence from Gupta India, which comes primarily over uh, sea routes into Vietnam and, and Cambodia uh, and into the capital at Nanjing and influences uh, Sichuan as well. Next, please. Uh, just to look uh, more closely again, this is a typical Chinese robe uh, with these columnar like looking uh, images of two monks and two bodhisattvas flanking the Buddha. This is a stele in, in the, in the Gardner Museum in Boston. Um, but again, and this is to show that uh, the, the revolution in styles comes from a native Chinese taste that's represented in the South. You know, South China is oftentimes not very well represented in our understanding of China. Everything begins in the North, in Beijing, or the Yellow River Valley, uh, but the South is which really much more pivotal to the development of China than oftentimes these northerners are willing to admit. Next, please. So here we find uh, a much, uh, I mean, you can see stylistically that there's a, a change in, in new cave temples that are opened in Hebei with northern Qi. Uh, the Buddha's body is, looks much more like a, a column or a pose as if there's a Qi or breath or air inside the chest that is being um, emphasized. The head becomes much larger in relationship to the body. Anyway, this, these stylistic changes come about due to what it usually is identified to the Gupta influence and coming uh, from Southern precedent. Next, please. Not, by the way, in a giving uh, precedent to these Xianbei or, or barbarians from the Northwest. Okay, so Buddhism continues to be the political unifier of dynastic uh, power. Um, and these are the, what we've just talked in new simplicity and interest in three dimensionality. And it, it climaxes during the Tang period, but it begins to show very well at the caves that we just looked at at Tianlong Shan, uh, east of Xi'an, Shangtang Shan, um, and a variety of places, and particularly with the new finds that have been found in, in Guangxi and Xinzhou, Shandong province, um, which is represented in this gallery. Next, please. Um, this is the novel image of Chinese invention that is represented. Uh, you know, the Chinese continue to emphasize values that are close to their uh, own beliefs and um, what they respect. These are uh, twin Buddhas, and they essentially, to me, represent, despite the fact they're from, again, the Lotus Sutra, uh, they represent sort of this bal balance between uh, for natural forces that is such a common denominator of most uh, representations, whether it's Taoist or Buddhist or, or uh, secular. Next, please. What, uh, and I won't go into all these historic details, but there are lots of people that came from, from Gupta India to work in, in China, because China, Chinese in Nanjing and in Sichuan, uh, where, where Buddhism was thriving, wanted to have the latest up-to-date foreign uh, or Indian Buddhist icons. So there were people who were, who were famous for exploiting these novel and exotic themes, and their, their names are known in history. Next, please. So, that on the left, some of you may recognize, that is an image from India. And it represents a Gupta period, a Gupta India period aesthetics. It's a standing Buddha with string drapery, which is oftentimes identified as wet, because you can see the body emerge from behind the drapery. This is, these are two uh, old images, uh, but they represent copies of this Gupta period type of image. This is, is from uh, the South, Wan Fossil, which has tons of very interesting images in Sichuan, but it dates a century later. This is fifth, this is sixth, and this is sixth. 
and this is from Chengdu, but at the time it was created when the Northern Zhou had conquered the, uh, the Liang in Sichuan. So two Chinese images where this dreamlike drapery is interpreted not as wet drapery as much as it is in the Gupta precedence, pre uh, prototype or precedent. But you can see the interpretation of the world is very much dependent upon this, the rich effect of, of uh, drapery folds that are schematized in the uh, Indian prototype. And, the, and what you see at the Met in, in terms of Northern Qi emphasis, Eastern Wei emphasis, and here is this emphasis upon an incre incredibly rich, luxuriant oriole filled with the canthuses of uh, and uh, other rich vegetal motifs in this contrast with the simplicity of the body that emerges through. You don't see these orioles here, but they once did exist. Uh, but this, this shows that there's a very close correspondence in the Chinese at this particular point try to work out the qualities of a solid body and, it's, and, and what it would, how, it, how it should look in terms of new ideals of uh, Chinese Buddhism. Next, please. So, um, uh, I'm not going to, uh, basically what we've been talking about is, is this uh, resurgence of a fleshy, strong head, a very powerful head, and, and a stronger, more solid body. Uh, these influences are remarkably well preserved in these limestone and marble, marble sculptures recently discovered in Qingzhou, Shandong, which are represented in this exhibit here at Throck Gardens. Um, and there's a variety of Buddhist styles that reflect not only the renewed Guptan influence of Gandhar and Mataram Buddhist types of the Gupta period, uh, but also exhibit interpretations in the new South Indian Buddhist styles of Amaravati um, and related Funanese Buddhist styles uh, known from Cambodia, Vietnam, even Borbudur, if any of you have been to Java. Uh, that particular style of Buddhist representation is based on Guptan precedent. And so is the styles during Northern Qi in China. Next, please. So this is a, this is a uh, bronze. It's not from uh, India, by the way. That's uh, incorrect. It's from um, it, it's it's from Vietnam, but it represents the um, Amaravati style. This is from China, and it's in a private collection of a Cleveland uh, curator. And this is an example from Longxing Se in Shandong, which is identical to one of uh, Spencer Throckmorton's pieces that is, um, whether there are one or two around here, and you can see them when the lights are on. So all this new, new stuff is coming directly from India, but being reinterpreted by the Chinese. And if you look at the next two, next, please. At this one, and the next one, and the next one, that there is an incredible, uh, an incredible invention uh, of Chinese aesthetics combined with this renewed interest in the solidity of the head as well as the solidity of the body. I mean, you don't find true naturalism, but we, what you do find is a combination of an emphasis upon this full body head, which is just, it's totally Chinese interpretation. Uh, and it's a, it's a beautiful rendition, and some of the most beautiful images, you know, exist from the Northern Qi, it's represented by that head over there. These are actually from Longxing Se remains uh, that have been uncovered from caches in uh, Shandong. Um, but the uh, jewelry, uh, if you could see it in detail, is a combination of Indian motifs and, and Chinese jewels. So there's sort of a new uh, interest and in, in sort of a uh, breakthrough in terms of adapting their material aesthetics with, with this, this new resurgence of influence that's coming from India, but that in the long run will end in something uh, completely Chinese in aesthetic and uh, Chinese in experimentation. And these, these three, these two images back in front of a Bodhisattva and in front of a Buddha, although they represent iconographic um, uh, uh, principles of Buddhism, they, the interpretation is usually more Chinese in aesthetic than it is uh, foreign. Next, please. Okay, so 
You know that Buddhism died in China, I mean in India. The, the Huns uh, invaded, later Turks in the early 6th century, then of course um, Muslim came in. But uh, yeah, Buddhism died there, and so as a consequence, Buddhism developed its most uh, you know, humanizing and secularizing characteristics during the Tang, most cosmopolitan international during the Tang period, and later phases of Chinese history. It definitely did not die out, but it did die out in, in, um, in India, although uh, Hinayana Buddhism survived in, of course, in Indonesia and Southeast Asia, Thailand, etc. And Mahayana uh, survived in, in China. But um, next, please. Th these are two pieces that are, are some of the most uh, expressively um, dynamic uh, examples of northern Qi uh, top-notch art, whether it's the head of a bodhisattva or a standing image of the Buddha with a slightly protruding belly and schematized drapery. This, this particular image shows you that uh, there, although there's alliance on the, on the Indian prototype, it's, it's um, Chinese in terms of um, this sort of spiritual expression uh, through the interpretation of the, the uh, iconographic frontal image, although it's interpreted in the round in three dimensions, but the emphasis upon the head, which has this sort of spiritual um, expression that is, is unique to uh, the Chinese interpretation. And that's all. Yeah. Uh, in one of the early slides that you 
showed on the page that pointed out to us the holes in the back wall that were uh -huh. from the support. Would that have been then at the front of the cave or just over the top? Front of the cave, yeah. I mean, the, the theory is that, that these supported, uh, uh, you know, wooden uh, supports, on, uh, supports mm -hmm. that would create the temple facade in front of this image. So you would actually go in to uh, either you know, kneel in front of this image, but there would be a, a wood temple uh, structure in front. Which would have also offered some protection. Which would have offered some protection. All, all of that has really just disappeared, particularly at Yunga, where, where people oftentimes um, can use the sandstone for their own purposes. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Well, did, did the case uh, survive the Cultural Revolution? Well, a lot of, it, believe it or not, a lot of the images were beheaded. But um, uh, uh, yes, yes, they did. I mean, uh, uh, well, I mean, they were pilfered, um, and, you know, to different degrees by different types of people. But they, uh, yeah, I mean, they were, and they were also used as sort of. Um, Dormitories for the troops, especially in, at Dongbang uh, during the various phases of, of the re re revolutionary period. But you have to uh, imagine these are from the sixth century, fifth and fourth centuries AD, and, and we're in 20, 2016. The fact that they've survived this long, they've lost mostly their facades. I mean, Dongbang just looks like a concrete uh, facade because they've got concrete stairs leading up to all the caves. But originally, no, they would have been. They were on a, a very high terrace, but you know the Gobi Desert is right near Dongpong, so and it's an oasis. So, but it must have been beautiful in its in its heyday with camels trekking back and forth. But the cave caves have been undergone various periods of conservation, and yes, they've been pilfered over over the years by various you know Western forces. As I mean, during various phases of weakness in the Chinese economy, yeah, as well as. Um, uh, by Chinese themselves, but they have survived. Um, and, uh, although, as I said, their facades have mostly disappeared. And, you know, the, and, and many of, if you go to Lishan in Sichuan, you can find that, that some of the uh, the staircases to these caves at higher levels are, are uh, preserved. And so, you know, uh, you had to, you had to be healthy in order to get up to some of these these uh, caves in order to worship or to or to circumambulate if they if they were constructed that way, or and, and and lots of them were used for lecture halls as lecture halls for dharma halls. But anyway, uh, yeah, um, they've undergone all sorts of you know uh, historical desecration. But they've also been uh, China right now is is really focusing on conservation, um, on co uh, cultural heritage issues. I mean, it's been the big theme for the past 15 years. In archaeological journals, that's all you read about is, is conservation, cultural heritage issues. And so they've really put a lot of money into trying to restore, restore these things, yeah, actively. How about the various purges that happened during, uh, like, 577 and in uh, oh, things were destroyed. I mean, all these monasteries were destroyed. I mean, when, when there's a political uh, purge, you know, it, it hits all all parts of the country, uh, and then to uh, and then things are just rebuilt. Uh, if it's the next, if this happened in the Tang period, it happened in the Northern Zhou period. It happened, you know, as you know, it happened um, in the Sixth Dynasties period. Uh, but there's a lot of labor available or was and has been uh, for reconstructing. And, and you know, belief, uh, you can't really wipe out belief very easily. So it's, it's something that was always in the case of, of the uh, purge by this uh, Taoist leading emperor. I don't know how extensive, but it was pretty extensive according to the uh, records that have been unearthed from the Wei Shu, the history of Wei. Um, and, and that the basic, next, the basic thing that happened uh, with the next emperor is that he, he ordered, it, it was uh, you know, under his decree, his political decree, um, his state decree, that everybody should build uh, two temples in, in, their, in their cities or towns or capitals. And that's what would happen. 
Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah.